Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The government shutdown is causing anxiety for some Hoosier workers. Even the people here in Indiana are willing to stand out here in the freezing cold to say that the government needs to open back up. What's behind the low number of students passing the bar exam? But if there's a problem with the test and it's disproportionately affecting certain groups or certain folks, we certainly have to address that. And the governor used his State of the State address to continue to put pressure on legislators to pass a comprehensive hate crimes law. But will his own party get on board? He stated his preference. I didn't hear a line uh, being drawn or, you know, say my way or the highway. That's not the Governor Holcomb style. Those stories and the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. As the partial government shutdown drags on, workers are becoming more anxious. As Tyler Lake reports, federal employees are pushing for a resolution to the stalemate and a check in the mail. A small group of federal workers gathered outside the Birch by Federal Building this week to protest and call for an end to the partial government shutdown. Members of the American Federation of Government Employees, the country's largest federal employee union, says it's unfair members of Congress get paid while they struggle to support their families. Renee McCammon works for the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA. She says she hopes to send a message to federal lawmakers. Even the people here in Indiana are willing to stand out here in the freezing cold to say that the government needs to open back up. Retired Defense Finance and Accounting Service employee Frank Rock calls the situation shameful. It is wrong to force an employee who wants to work, who has loyalty to their government, forcing them to work without pay. Victor Rubinacci agrees, but he's still going into work every day at a federal prison in Terre Haute. And we have to keep the prison running, and it's a bad feeling, yes. We're going in not getting paid. But at the same time, we have to keep the prison running. He says unlike furloughed employees, he and the 700 other people who work at the federal prison can't collect unemployment because even though there's no paycheck, they are still considered to be working. I mean, a lot of employees are going through rough times. I mean, we have a lot of single fathers, single mothers, and it's just a rough time for people. I mean, it's, to ask people to come and work for free and still put gas in their cars and feed their children at the same time, it's, it's, it's a bad situation. Communities across the state are stepping up to help many of the federal workers who find themselves in desperate situations. The city of Brazil is just down the road from the prison. Officials there are waiving late fees for federal workers if they can't pay their city water or sewer bills on time. From a government standpoint, I don't want to be any part of any, you know, discomfort this would cause financially. And if there's anything we can do to help, we're going to do it. Wyndham and Rubinacci both say they want to see elected officials work together to end the shutdown. My best case scenario starting today is, is for Congress, Senate, everybody in government to do the job we elected you to do. Stop taking vacations, no weekends off, you work until there's a resolution. We're working every day, you do the same. But the question remains, can lawmakers come to an agreement before federal workers miss another paycheck? For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake.
The byproducts of a strong economy and low employment are forcing Indiana police and fire departments to look harder for qualified applicants. As Brock Turner reports, a bill lawmakers are considering the session could make it easier for departments to find the help they need. Jerry Purcell was born and raised in Richmond, Indiana. One day after he graduated from college at Ball State, he submitted his application for the Richmond Fire Department. He faced stiff competition, and it took him years to finally be hired. I started in the fire service 35 years ago. You had to live in the city of Richmond to even apply for our department. And I wasn't happy when that expanded out to contiguous county, to be quite honest with you. Fast forward 35 years, and the situation is vastly different. We used to get 260 applicants every other year for this job. I now have a continuous open hiring process and have eight vacancies. Purcell says that's costing taxpayers $250,000 in overtime. That is a burden on the taxpayers. It's a burden on my members who have to work and be ordered in to work the ambulances uh, shift after shift after shift. So for those reasons, I need to get hired up. Purcell says he has to order firefighters in to provide essential emergency services. Unlike other businesses, he doesn't have the luxury of serving fewer people or cutting the number of services he provides. When labor is tight, he's just expected to do more with less. Once we, no one wants to take the overtime, then we'll order a member in. And that can be um, someone uh, coming in here working 72 hours, et cetera, straight. And that's not healthy um, with the run load we currently have. The president of Indiana State Fire Union says Richmond is not an outlier. Departments across the state are struggling to find qualified applicants. It's getting harder to hire police officers and firefighters across Indiana. The job market's better. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. We all want that. But also um, getting eligible people to want these jobs when there's so many other options to them, it makes it a little more difficult. State Senator Mark Mesmer is sponsoring a bill that would loosen the residency requirements police and firefighters currently face. State law requires public safety workers to live no further than a contiguous county away from the department they're serving in. While simple, that creates some unusual circumstances. I had a constituent in southern Spencer County that lived about 15 miles from Evansville, but was in a non-contiguous county. Mesmer says there are a number of locations across Indiana where non-contiguous counties actually have areas closer than contiguous counties. Take Monroe, for example. Both Martin and Johnson counties have cities much closer to Bloomington than contiguous counties. In past sessions, language that would allow out-of-state residents to work for departments in Indiana has derailed the bill. Mesmer hopes that is not the case this year. If they try to throw it in, it'll probably be the demise of the bill, so I would, uh, I, I would object to adding the out-of-state language to it. Even though Purcell hopes he can eventually cross state lines, he's willing to accept anything that might help. He and Hanafi agree that the bill won't solve all of their staffing struggles. They say having a common statewide standard is important and hope this bill will begin to move the needle. Carefully screening the applicants they do receive remains critically important. We have to, we have to make it a little more flexible uh, for local governments to hire the best people. And don't forget, we want the best people. When I go in to that incident, that burning building, that, uh, that catastrophe, I want the person that's walking in there with me to be competent. I don't want to lower our standards. We want competent, good quality people. Purcell agrees and is doing everything in his power to keep his department fully staffed. Both say serving the citizens is their only goal. These are um, people with servants' hearts that want to help people. And people say that firefighters uh, want to help people. No, they have to help people. That's the way they're wired. And so, no, our people are going to do a tremendous job helping people, but we're going to burn them out. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Karen Pence, Vice President Mike Pence's wife, is teaching art at a Virginia school that bans gay students, kids who have gay parents, and gay school staff. Emmanuel Christian School also defines marriage as a union between a man and woman and says sex should only occur between a man and woman who are married. A spokesperson for Mrs. Pence's office calls it absurd that the school's religious beliefs have come under attack. A Roncalli High School guidance counselor who was placed on leave in August after her marriage to a woman became public is filing a discrimination claim against the school in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission will review the charge 
If approved, Shelley Fitzgerald can file a lawsuit in federal court. Her lawyer says the suit wouldn't be for personal gain. Noblesville teacher Jason Seaman is speaking in support of a bill that would allow 12 and 13 year olds charged with attempted murder to be sent to adult court. The bill was filed in part as a response to last year's shooting at Noblesville West Middle School, where Seaman was shot three times before tackling the 13 year old shooter. It also includes an amendment that would prevent released juveniles from buying a gun until they're at least 26 years old. The state has invalidated 2017 I-STEP scores for an entire school in Gary. Education officials call it one of the biggest cheating cases in state history. The I-STEP test vendor flagged unusual data from the Frankie W. McCullough Academy for Girls in Gary, prompting the Indiana Department of Education to take a closer look. The state suspended the licenses of several educators following the investigation, including the test coordinator, and the principal. Seven Oaks Classical School in Ellettsville is spending all of an almost part of an almost $900,000 state grant on instructional technology. The school received the Charter School Program Quality Counts Grant from the state in September. Headmaster Stephen Ship says the charter school strives to break away from the stereotype that classical schools focus solely on the humanities. I think the grant's a huge opportunity for our school and um, we, we're going to be doing a lot with these funds to benefit children who, who've chosen the school. He says Seven Oaks wants students' interactions with their peers and teachers to be conducted away from screens and the grant won't change that. City of Bloomington officials had their first meeting with a design firm this week to discuss plans for an expansion of the Monroe County Convention Center. The county commissioner sent a letter to Mayor John Hamilton asking him not to schedule the meeting about the project without including them. Hamilton says the city is the contracting entity and the meeting is to have those kinds of discussions with the new architect. Commissioners say they'll draft a new memorandum of understanding by the end of the month. Indiana's statewide officers took their oaths of office this week. The Secretary of State, Auditor, and Treasurer all won re-election bids in November. Secretary of State Connie Lawson promised her office would take an active role in financial management and election security. My office will remain vigilant and will work with all stakeholders to ensure that every Hoosier, every Hoosier's vote is safe and secure. Tara Klutz swore in as the first certified public accountant elected as state auditor. Kelly Mitchell started her second term as state treasurer. She says she will continue to expand investment in higher education and plans to support financial investment among Hoosiers with disabilities. Joey just wrapped up an election and we're already hearing things about the next election coming our way. It seems like new candidates uh, with local races are popping up all the time. Especially in the mayoral race this year. It'll be a busy year. Absolutely. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Governor Eric Holcomb used his State of the State address this week to lay out his plans for 2019. And fewer people are passing the Indiana State Bar Exam than ever, and it has some questioning whether the test really reflects what lawyers need to know. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week.
Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Governor Eric Holcomb laid out plans for Indiana's future this week during his State of the State address. He wants to free up millions of dollars over the next couple of years to increase teacher pay, while also pushing forward infrastructure projects and workforce development. Our State House reporter Brandon Smith joins us to talk about the governor's plans and how top lawmakers from both parties are responding. So, Brandon, the governor threw out a lot of numbers in regards to school funding and teacher pay. His budget proposal calls for a 2% increase in school funding each year over the next two years. And he said this about money from the state surplus he was opening up to schools. I believe local school districts should allocate 100% of the $140 million to increasing teacher paychecks. So, Brandon, can you break down what all of this will actually mean for schools and teachers? Well, on those 2% overall funding increases, that really just covers inflation. So many have questioned whether schools will actually be able to use those increases to increase teacher salaries. But on Holcomb's new proposal, what he wants to do is use state surplus dollars to fully fund a teacher pension fund. And doing so would reduce by about $70 million a year the amount districts statewide have to pay into it. And Holcomb, like you heard, wants to use wants schools to use that savings to increase teachers' salaries, but he doesn't require them to. So where do Democrats in the State House stand on the governor's proposal? Well, they're very supportive of that proposal, and they've long called for using the surplus dollars on a one-time basis as a short-term solution for low teacher pay. And now the governor once again emphasized the need for a hate crimes law in the state. This policy includes a list of victim characteristics, including sexual orientation and gender identity. Most Democrats seem on board with this, but some Republicans in the state house aren't with the governor on this one. What are they saying? Well, it's no secret that probably the biggest issue that a hate crimes proposal has to overcome is right-wing groups' opposition to phrases like gender identity and sexual orientation. But what's been happening this session is we've started to see Republican legislative leaders coalesce around a different approach to a hate crimes bill, one that doesn't include any victim characteristics. Now, there are a lot of people who say that's an unconstitutional way to do it, but Republican legislative leader Brian Bosma has been supportive of that approach and continues to be even after Holcomb's address. He stated his preference. I didn't hear a line uh, being drawn or, you know, say my way or the highway. That's not uh, Governor Holcomb's style. Which version of a hate crimes bill ultimately starts to advance is, to me, the biggest unanswered question of the session so far. And, Brandon, teacher pay and hate crimes were a central theme in the address, but the governor did get around to some other topics. Uh, what else did he touch upon? Almost everything else was really a recitation of the issues that he's been talking about since he even first ran for governor more than two years ago. So that would be workforce, economic development issues, a lot on that, the opioid epidemic, and then health issues like infant and maternal mortality. All right, Brandon, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Indiana Chief Justice Loretta Rush hailed better service for what she calls court customers during her annual State of the Judiciary Address this week. That includes efforts to address the substance abuse epidemic and targeting criminal justice reform measures. Rush points to legal services for low-income Hoosiers who can't get a lawyer as an example. Justice only for those customers who can afford it is not justice for all. In fact, it's not justice at all. Rush says a recent survey shows 80% of low-income households were, who were in civil court last year lacked legal counsel. She wants the legislature to increase legal services funding by $1 million in the new budget. The state is trying to figure out why fewer people are passing Indiana's bar exam. The number hit an all-time low last February when only 51% of all takers passed. As Barbara Brozier reports, a study commission is looking into what could be contributing to the problem and whether the state needs to make changes. Emmanuel McMiller has known since eighth grade that he wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to help people. He attended a pre-law academy for high school and then ended up here at the University of Notre Dame. So this is my third year of law school, so I graduate in May, um, and then after that I'll be working in Indianapolis. But he has to pass Indiana's bar exam first. It includes 200 multiple choice questions, an essay portion, 
and a performance test. And just trying to hope that the preparation um, of three years in law school and also the bar prep will um, help. But it's hard not to think about. McMillers heard about slipping bar passage rates across the country. Last year, 61% of all takers passed the Indiana exam. At Notre Dame, only a few students take Indiana's version of the test. And the pass rate was 91%. But educators here say the nationwide trend is still cause for concern. It is a challenge for uh, educators everywhere. Uh, we have students who are exceptionally gifted uh, and talented, and uh, we advise all of them the bar exam is going to be difficult no matter where you take it. Some suggest the plummeting scores nationwide are a reflection of students rather than the exam. When a significant drop happened in 2014, the president of the National Conference of Bar Examiners sent a letter to law schools across the country that said indicators, quote, point to the fact that the group that sat in July 2014 was less able than those who took the exam in the previous year. But leaders at Indiana University's Maurer School of Law say the exam doesn't necessarily test what it truly means to be a good lawyer. You want a baseline knowledge. But really what we teach them in law school is how to think and how to acquire knowledge. It's not important for your lawyer to have tons of law memorized in her head. It's important that she should be able to access it. That has some questioning whether the structure and content of the test should change to better reflect what lawyers really need to know. A 2017 report that was a collaboration between bar associations and the state's law schools points to several potential issues with the exam. The state uses what's called the multi-state bar examination, or MBE. The multiple choice portion tests students on everything from criminal law to torts. It makes up half of the overall exam score. The multi-state, I think, has 14 subjects. Uh, in Indiana, if you take our bar exam, you have to know those 14 subjects plus more, many of which are uh, Indiana laws opposite of what the multi-state tests. Uh, for example, in some comparative faults, some torts, some criminal law areas, some real estate and probate, it's completely different from what you have to know for the multi-state. Some states are switching to a different testing format called the Uniform Bar Exam, which is one of several changes a commission will consider in the coming months. The Indiana Supreme Court ordered its creation in response to the unprecedented decline in bar exam passage rates. I think the court's decision uh, indicates a level of seriousness about uh, uh, the protection of the public. Uh, the reason we have bar admissions processes, the reason we have both um, an ethics screen and a uh, competence uh, exam uh, is to protect uh, citizens who, um, uh, who go to lawyers for help. The court wants the commission to consider several questions, including whether it should lower the passing score on the exam or possibly change some of the content. The general objective of the, of the test is to establish uh, what is called minimal competence. Um, uh, so there, there are pieces of law that, that are important to segments of the population. One of the questions is, do, you, do we simply have more than we really need to assure that level of competence. The commission has until December to draft its recommendations. McMiller will take the bar long before then, but he's glad the state is taking the declining passing rates seriously. After all, the bar is a test he's been preparing for most of his life. It's definitely a worry, but my main focus right now is getting through the prep material, getting through the semester, um, and then we'll see where the chips fall. And reporter Barbara Brozier joins us now. Barbara, so what are attorneys saying about how those lower rates are impacting the profession? So there's one concern, Joe, about what it could be doing to impact uh, the diversity of the legal field. Now, the state doesn't have a lot of data about how different groups are performing on the test, and that's because a national organization actually scores the exam, but there are worries that if fewer people are passing the exam, the field is then less diverse. So that's something that the study commission is going to be looking into. Now, you mentioned another exam the state could switch to. What are some of those advantages? So that's the uniform bar exam, and more than 30 states have adopted this over the past few years. The biggest benefit is that the score is transferable. So that means if you take the UBE in one state and you move to a different state that also has that form of the exam, you don't have to retake the test and you can just 
start practicing law, your score holds. But the disadvantage of that exam is it doesn't have some of the Indiana specific things. Like right now we have an Indiana essay portion that's really crucial, educators say, if lawyers are going to be practicing in this state, they need to know that. So are universities feeling pressure about this now? Well, you know, they're feeling some pressure, yeah. but they're not really teaching to the test. One thing that could change things, though, the American Bar Association is considering raising the number, the percentage of students that would have to pass the bar in order for universities, their law schools, to maintain their accreditation. So that's something to watch for. Barbara, thank you very much. Well, you may not be enjoying the cooler temperatures. Paoli Peaks is welcoming them. The ski resort opened Saturday nearly a month later than last year. We're another business. We try to keep an eye on our costs the same as anybody else does. Uh, so with the season getting pushed back a little later, we do make some changes internally. Um, but we do everything we can to get this place open still as soon as possible. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding expertise results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world, education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism, alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you.